Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Jane Cherry from COPAC. And on behalf of COPAC, I'd like to give everyone a warm welcome. We are very glad that you are with us and joining us for COPAC's 20 year celebration. I'm going to start by sharing with all of you who is in the room or who is still on the way or will join us tomorrow and the next day. We have a few transport issues, but people will stop checking in. So first we have some partners from the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign and other organizations who are building alternatives in their communities or in their organizations or who are engaging in various struggles. And these include Devine from the West Coast Food Sovereignty and Solidarity Forum, We've got Magda from Beacon School, Patrick, a fellow farmer from Mpopo, Patrick Chikana from PE, another Patrick Brennan from Kazakhele Township, Transition Township. Um, we have representatives from ACB, African Centre for Biodiversity, from Biowatch, Earth Rice Trust and Russell's Daddy, Greenhouse Project, and then also Tinga, Tabaka and Dorda, Chisamani, Water Caucus, The Waste Pickers, Women, Oxfam, Johannesburg Against Injustice, Sharp, and Earthline. Welcome. And there's more. We have some activists and academics and trade union representatives with us. There's Patrick Bond, Jackie, Gannett, Lazola, Sharon, Natalia, Hamida, and Gideon. Welcome to you. And then there are some younger faces in the room, and these are students from BITS. Who COPAC has been working with athletes to mobilize, but also part of the Emancipatory Future Studies program. We also have one partner from BITS, and that is Karina, who we are working with um, for the Food Sovereignty Centre, uh, and we will be introduced to that tomorrow. And then there are also COPAC associates, staff, and ex staff members. We've got Michelle, Andrew, Courtney, Ferial, and Sandy with us. And some international guests who we are very excited to have, Christopher Chase Dunn from the US, David Savage from CARES Mauritius, Norka Lee from Bolivia, we will meet tomorrow. And then we are also grateful that two of our funders are here to celebrate with us. We've got Kamala from Friedrich Ebert Slipton and Fredson from Amyam from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. RLF is funding this particular conference, so thank you and welcome. And then on that note, funders. Um, they are very strict of registers, so there is a register going around. Please make sure that you sign it. Those of you who flew in, please make sure you give me your boarding pass stubs and then another other, of other registers that I ask you to sign throughout the course of the day. Please sign a register every day. Alright, and then finally we have some members of the COPAC board. We've got Nish, the board chairperson, Jackie Cox, Dora unfortunately couldn't make it. She has apologized to her father, unfortunately passed away. And then we have Annie sitting with us. So a few other apologies. We've got an apology from Dinga, who is ill, and Ayanda from the UPM, who is ill as well. So Dinga was the former deputy director of Chisimani School Factors. All right, so I hope that is clear on the room. In fact, we also got someone from NIHSS. Um, if I've missed anyone, I'm sorry. Maybe you weren't invited. Maybe you were. Maybe it's my mistake. I'm really sorry. Um, but now I'm going to go through the program with you. So as you would have walked in, there's a register, but also a program. Anyone who doesn't have a program, we can give you one. We've all got programs. Great. So I'll start with today. I see you all got the memo that today the venue is in this location. Tomorrow the venue is... Where? Please don't come here, we won't be here. So today, on today's program, we're going to start with a panel. First, Vish will talk more about COPAC and our history. And then we'll have a panel looking at South African and global crisis of capitalism. We'll then have a short tea break. And after that, Chris Chase Dunn will give a talk on the features of capitalism. Then the last panel for today will be a screening of an animation. A presentation of the APSA campaign, followed by the launch of the land guide and then a delicious dinner. On day two, at Bits Club. <laughs> um, day two, we will start with an opening plenary on the climate crisis, followed by three streams in three different venues. And for these streams, there's different topics. You can pick one and just go to that one. We'll have them labeled at the venue. 
We will then have lunch, and right after that, we'll take a walk to the <coughs> food gardens. We will also visit the farmers market. So please bring along small cash if you would like to support the farmers. And then we will launch our murals at the Food Sovereignty Centre, and we'll go from Bolivia and we'll give a brief talk about the murals. Then we'll go back to the conference venue when we'll go we'll give another talk about um, murals and uh, art and activism. And then we'll have, after tea, we'll have a panel on feminism. And then after that, we'll launch the co op book followed by a delicious dinner at this club. Day three, also at this club, this is Saturday now, we'll start off with a plenary on way two for the left in South Africa and globally, followed by tea and then three streams again, which follow the same format as Friday. And then we will end with the conference with a collective reflection and closure, followed by lunch. And then just to mention, it's, it's at the bottom of the program, we'll have an ideas wall up tomorrow. So today, HMLA will present on AXA's campaign for agroecology. We're also going to have various presentations on building pathways for food sovereignty and climate justice. And we really encourage you to look at those questions at the bottom of the program, to write them down in the papers which we'll provide tomorrow, and to stick them up on the ideas board. Right, that's all from me. Are there any questions at this point before I hand over to Bish? All right, thank you, Bish. Well, uh, thank you, Jane, and uh, Amanda! Okay, my name is Vishwa Satka. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm an academic at WITS, but I also chair the board of the Corporate and Policy Alternative Center. Uh, COPAC is 20 years old uh, this year. Uh, this conference and the celebration is happening in the context of two very important uh, realities. The first is the unraveling of the neoliberal project globally. It's in crisis, it is failing, and it is morphing into an authoritarianism. In some places, a neo-fascism. The other condition that's out there today is the unraveling of the National Liberation Project in South Africa. It is exhausted, it is showing some very hideous symptoms, and uh, it cannot be trusted with our future. It's in that context we have to really ask questions about the left. Is there a left imagination left in South Africa? An imagination post-social democratic post-Soviet, post-national liberation? Are there left alternatives in South Africa? It's a very, very important issue. Or are we defeated? And is the defeat absolute? Do we have anything to offer the people, the struggle, the working class in South Africa? And I want to contend that the work that the Cooperative and Policy Alternative Center has been busy with is one modest contribution to the left effort in South Africa. COPAC was formed 20 years ago, co-founded through a teleconference. Two of us were huddled in the head office of the Communist Party. The National Political Education Officer of the Communist Party and myself. I worked at Naledi, Kusatu's think tank at that point. But Tamida, I have to say this, uh, we were convinced that Naledi wasn't really enough to advance alternatives at that point in time. Uh, it was a very strategic institution, well positioned vis-a-vis -vis the organized working class. Kosato had very, very important resolutions on socialism. And my debate with people at Naledi was, why isn't the think tank of Kosato giving substance to those resolutions? I lost the debate. And that's why for me and my comrades in the Communist Party, um, well, I went to the Communist Party and told them, listen, I want to go back to the ground. I cut my teeth in the 80s. I want to go back to township communities. I want to go back to grassroots movements. So we sat there in this teleconference, and the other person on the other end, outside of Gauteng, was an uncle of mine. Uh, he was an old operator in the Communist Party. He had the press, the underground press of the Communist Party. He was Operation Vula uh, operative in the country with all kinds of networks. He's dead now. But we, we sat at this teleconference and grappled with where do we go? And so the idea of COPAC comes from that. 
the idea that we go back to the ground, not in a typical NGOized way, not in a way that we're going to control struggles, not in a way that we are going to prevail, but in a way that's catalytic, in a way that synergizes with forces on the ground. And we build, and we build bottom up. Because my generation was in the Communist Party because we were not Stalinists. Okay? We were democratic socialists. I got expelled because I kept defending those principles in the Communist Party. Anyway, so COPAC comes from that story, and it's, this, it's in this larger objective context that we are reflecting on our practice. So one of the legs on which we've walked in the 20 years is emancipatory eco-utopian praxis. And that means that you're not just dreaming and desiring a better world in abstraction, but we are building it as we walk, as we struggle, <coughs> and as we attempt to change things in our world and, and broader. So in the 20 years of our existence, one of the things we struck out on was pioneering cooperative development in South Africa. In the, in the early 2000s, when COPAC was up and running, one of the things we prioritized was shaping the cooperative framework of South Africa. The RDP gave us warrant, it gave us a mandate to set up cooperatives, and so we went for it. And we convened the first civil society conference to develop an agenda for cooperatives in the country. That was in 2001. We took that agenda further to the point where we got what we call democratic systemic reform in place. We've got a cooperatives act, a post-apartheid act. It's the first piece of post-apartheid legislation of cooperatives, 2005 act. And it opens space for us to develop a democratic regulatory system for cooperatives. The next piece of legislation that comes is the Cooperative Banks Act of 2007. We also shaped that. I served on the board of the Cooperative Banks Development Agency for a few years. The idea there was to structurally diversify the financial system. The banks are too powerful. Patrick Bond talks, talks, talks about new globalization. We were going to do it with the Cooperative Banks Act. We we're going to try and beat the banks. But the problem, again, is the agency from below. And I'll come back to it. The other thing that we broke ground on was working bottom-up in community spaces. And here I want to really thank my dear comrade in the room, Annie Subin, because we intersected at a very critical moment uh, as COPAC was emerging. I was, the, uh, was associated with the Greenhouse Project in the inner city, but Annie had a passion, and she did a lot of activist work in the Ivory Park area, and uh, felt that the ground she wanted to break was to demonstrate an alternative eco way of living. And we, we, we really converged because I brought my deep social justice, socialist orientation uh, into that process. And we ended up building an eco village in Ivory Park under the auspices of the Eco City Project. It was the first eco village of its kind in an African community. It was path breaking, it was ahead of its time. We had many problems, of course. The community didn't understand it, so we had to really do the grassroots work of education. We had a march against us, going back to education, to the point where we had people queued up to have their homes in the eco-village. That's where we took it to. When the World Summit of Sustainable Development was happening, we had on average 300 visitors a day coming to learn from this eco-village space. We had mud brick houses. Uh, we had solar technologies. Uh, we had bicycle cooperatives gardening and farming cooperatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was a partnership with the city of Joburg, which basically ended after the WSSD because they used us and dumped us. Because the bureaucracy could not think ecologically okay, in the city. Anyway, we also did a lot of work on sustainable local manufacturing. So we looked at old buildings, particularly in the East Rand, rehabilitated them. We had 25 projects like this, working with retrenched NUMSA workers. East Rand is one of the industrial hubs of the country. And many, many workers lost their jobs. And the Communist Party could not respond to these things in the alliance. So one response was sustainable local manufacturing hives. People's housing was another framework that we shaped from below. And in the context of Kauteng, pushed very, very hard for this to be a democratic process, where communities could plan and design their own housing and living spaces. 
And of course, cooperative financing was another thing we shaped over the years. The other very crucial network that we pulled together, and it's a pity Ayanda Kota couldn't make it because he's really, really ill and he sent me a very apologetic message. We worked very closely with the unemployed people's movements. Many grew up in the post-apartheid period because of the structural fallout. The deep globalization in this economy has not worked. It's brutalized people. It's created a crisis of social reproduction. And so we worked very closely with various unemployed people's movements. So people like Andrew, who's in the room, played a very, very crucial role working with those movements. Atish, who's not here today, was also one of those young people. Helping unemployed people's organizations build cooperatives. We worked with waste pickers. The South African Waste Pickers Association, uh, I'm hoping they're going to join us here today. Uh, we've invited them. They also have worker cooperatives, and they're organizing an approach towards zero waste out of that experience. We have various community organizations that we've networked with and linked with over the years, across the country. We work with small-scale farmers, etc. And in a way, we have imbued these relationships with an approach to building a solidarity economy that changes production, consumption, finance, and living relations. It's incipient. It's in different little spaces across the country, and we can talk a bit more about that uh, later on. We've also co-founded the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, and we were able to aggregate and bring together agrarian sector forces, food justice forces, environmental justice forces, and others into this campaign platform. It's now a national platform, and it's five years old. We've convened a left dialogue forum. This is, by the way, the FOP left dialogue forum. And it's been mainly with grassroots activists, not representing their organizations, but to create a thinking space, to stand apart from the heat of struggle, and to just think deeply about what are we doing, and to have the hard debates, and to pose those questions. Because today, there's a populism that's circulating in our political spaces. And the populism is easy. And the populism doesn't ask the hard questions. It doesn't have a strategic politics. You throw a brick, you burn something, you think you're bringing about a revolution. It's not so simple. Okay? So the left dialogue forum for us is very, very crucial. And going forward, we'll be convening it. Next year, we want to talk about how do we strengthen movements. After that, we do want to talk about parties and strategies and things like that. To really mature a perspective on the left. The third thing we've done is a climate justice campaign. Uh, and out of this, or central to this, actually, is the climate justice charter process in South Africa. So this is where it all started, in Ivory Park. And basically, we've had a connection uh, with Ivory Park since uh, 1999, working with Annie and others. Uh, we worked there even after Annie left, and, and did a lot of work to think about how do we take the eco-village to a solidarity economy level, and working with the community, to the point where People like Andrew and Atish couldn't go back to Ivory Park because the ANC put out death threats and so on. Something was working there. Something was coming together. We were building agency. We were building people's power. And people were asking critical questions. And they wanted to own the development process in Ivory Park as we went down this road. And so we had to withdraw from Ivory Park. We couldn't go back there. And today the ANC has taken over the Eco Village and they painted it in their colors and so on, and so on, and so on. Well, that's where we are. So, over 300 worker cooperatives, this is an activist tool that we've developed. It really synthesizes all our thinking about worker cooperatives. And the idea of worker cooperatives is something we've also shared with unions, Gideon. When NUMSA in 2009 had a big job summit, it was looking for answers. And the one answer we shared with NUMSA was, take over factories. They're doing it in Argentina. And we did, by the way, take over the factory with Mawusa, the mine line factory. Workers worked there for 30 years. And we took over that factory, and we helped them develop a worker cooperative in that context. Of course, the DBSA wasn't up to the task. The state wasn't up to the task, welcome so many, to respond to this challenge. But this tool on worker cooperatives is available. It's on our webpage. Wherever you are, if you're in a community, in an unemployed people's organization, if you're in a trade union, and if your members are under threat, here's a tool, here's an answer, a worker cooperative. 
Okay, you can build worker cooperatives. We want legislation uh, for workers of this country. It's there. There's a space to build it. You can also build cooperative banks. Trade unions can build cooperative banks. We want the democratic systemic reform for that. So this is the oldest worker cooperative in South Africa. It's 30 years old. It's the fingerprint cooperative. It was set up by workers that were retrenched in the late 80s. And they're still going strong. And the point about this is that these workers didn't stop with their printing cooperative, which is relatively successful. They spawned a network in the Western Cape of other cooperatives. Now, we don't know these stories. Okay? Our imaginations are impoverished by possessive individualism, competition, and so on, the hegemonic consensus and, con and, and consciousness in our societies, even part of the left. So there are these networks that are there, they are beneath the surface, and we need to connect with them. But there are others as well. There are amazing stories of other cooperatives in Tinga and Tabakadoda, I don't know how the book was here now, but they've been doing amazing work in a rural community working with several cooperatives in the village, etc., etc. Uh, uh, comrades of Earthrise Trust in the Free State, uh, Gino sent me his apologies, I forgot to mention that. Uh, they are building a whole network of cooperatives around the farm that the former General Secretary of Kosati uh, is involved with, Jay Nigel, a close friend of mine. And so they are building a whole network of cooperatives around their farm and their space and so on. So the other thing we co-founded with the South African Food Sovereignty Campaign, as I said. Now, various forces have been trying to experiment with food sovereignty as an alternative to the globalized, industrial, food-based system in South Africa. And so we felt that it was important, at least since 2010, we've been beating this drum in the Solidarity Economy Network. Let's come together. Let's form a national platform. And let's share all our knowledge and our ideas and, and strategies and so on. To the point where we now have a campaign that is five years old. And it's a loose network. We learned lessons from the cycle of, two cycles of resistance. We learned lessons from the uh, APF, we learned lessons from the TAC, uh, and we learned lessons even from Fees Must Fall. And we realized in our debates that we're not gonna institutionalize in typical ways. What we are building actually is also going to be at the front lines of climate justice. Because as heating happens, food systems collapse, and ours has collapsed in the drought. Water gets compromised. So the kind of movement we need to be building is at the front lines of this, in communities, in villages, in towns, and cities. And so we had several food sovereignty festivals. We emerged out of a dialogue in 2014 across the country with all stakeholders in all nine provinces, and we had a right to food conference. And out of that consensus, we said we're going to build the National Food Sovereignty Campaign. The drought was happening at the same time, so the drought became central to our politics around food sovereignty. And so we had a drought speaker in the Malashleni with local communities at the heart of the most polluted part of this country. We also made the strategic breakthrough, as I've been saying, that we've got to build a different kind of movement in local spaces. So how you work with the soils in your community, the seed banking networks you need to put together, the uh, consumption side, the local community markets, etc. We need to build alternative food systems in our local spaces. So the strategic breakthrough we've made is mapped for you. There are little hubs everywhere uh, with networks of activists from the rural farmers in Limpopo to this university, Vitz University being a food sovereignty hub, where we're rolling out agroecology gardens, we are rolling out a farmer's market monthly, we're going to take you to see the food sovereignty center, etc., etc. There are various activist hubs where food sovereignty building is happening in the country right now. Bottom-up, grassroots, networking, aggregating forces from below. This bread march we had in 2016 was very, very important because the drought hit poor households very hard. 50% of poor household income is spent on food. Food prices have just gone up. 14 million people were going to bed hungry before the drought. Okay. And I would argue that it's, it's been worsened. The other thing we've initiated is the climate justice charter process for South Africa. And it comes out of this activism around the drought, around food sovereignty. And this year, particularly, we've taken it to another level 
where we brought together key constituencies in round tables, like we sat with Gideon and all the leading trade unions in the country, to ask the hard questions. Climate change is worsening, do you understand the challenge? And our unions understand the challenge, actually. Our worker leaders understand the science, they know what's going on. But we also ask the harder questions. Well, what is required for us to have this transition? What do workers want? Okay. What is needed for us to break through around ESCOM and things like that? What is the leverage that trade unions have to shape the just transition? And one of the levers they have is three trillion rands in pension funds. Trade unions can leverage that money to shape the just transition in South Africa. So these dialogues have been yielding some very powerful answers to the climate crisis. The faith-based organizations have answers to the climate crisis. The environmental justice organizations have answers to the climate crisis. So the climate justice charter process will culminate in a big conference in November <coughs> where we'll adopt a charter, a draft, which will travel even next year into local people's assemblies and we are hoping to take it to Parliament. Section 234 of the Constitution provides for charters to be adopted and we haven't tested it in South Africa. So we're going to take the charter there. But we are also going to be building a climate justice alliance as we go down this path. Because we have not done this in this country. And we need to bring forces together. Because without a powerful climate justice movement, we are not going to rise to the challenge of climate change. So that's also very crucial. The third thing that's fermenting in this process is a program to gridlock carbon capital. Some of us next year are going to have to chain ourselves to buildings. We're going to have to stop traffic in this country. We're going to have to gridlock key points and sites of carbon capital so that we push things even further in South Africa. So we build this movement and we make sure the just transition content that we want is coming to the fore. Okay. So that's where we're going to. We confronted the media in this process. Sanef, this is Ayanda Kota. It's a pity he's not here, he's very ill. Where we forced Sanef to recognize that they are not doing us a justice as a citizenry around climate change. Okay? And that dialogue is ongoing, we have a partnership with them, and so on. 20th September, many of our students in the room worked very, very hard. Courtney being one of them uh, at COPAC, working on this mural, uh, putting it together, and mobilizing students from the university come to Sasso. The, the second leg we've walked on is popular education to knowledge commonly. And here we've had various tools, activist-driven newsletters, popular education tools, web-based resources, and a left dialogue blog, a blog. So these are our newsletters. They're activist-driven platforms. Activists write for it. And they basically share what they are doing. They reflect on their practice and vice versa. And so this has become a very, very important platform for us to know what's going on in different parts of the country, but also internationally. We have, over the 20 years, developed about 15 activist tools. And we've done this in a polyphrian way. We reject banking knowledge. And yes, it's the life world of peoples. And it's out of that life world of peoples we develop language, we develop concepts of resistance and power. And so all our tools have always come out of grassroots struggles. We've always developed in a bottom-up participatory way. So it's not someone sitting at WITS writing the perfect document. That's not how we've done it. We've always workshopped it. We've brought organic knowledge or tacit knowledge together to shape these tools. So the People's Food Sovereignty Act comes out of a hunger tribunal in 2015 with the Human Rights Commission. It comes out of the drought speak-ups we've had. It comes out of the three national food sovereignty festivals we've had. And all the ideas that have been workshopped in those festivals and so on shape the Food Sovereignty Act. We learned about seeds from Aviwe Biko, from rural Eastern Cape. The section on seeds in this act is shaped by the thinking from there. There's the idea of a two-hectare farmer model. That comes from small-scale farmers that have workshopped us in our festival. So we don't want big farms, we want small farms. We want a two hectare size farm. Okay, so that's in the document. So it's imbued with that knowledge and so on. And it's a compass. And we shared it with the South African Parliament. And of course, uh, they were startled that it was an act. We've also been advancing commonly. 
throughout our project and process. So water, we developed a tool around water, with the Water Coalition, the Water Caucus in South Africa, some of the Legal Resources Center working on the right to water, etc. We developed seed saving tools to create community banks. The South African government is commodifying our seed system more and more and more. Okay? And it's giving more and more power to commercial farmers and to large transnationals like Monsanto, etc. I mean, Monsanto has its own act for GMOs. Okay? So we are saying, let's defy that. Let's have community seed banks. Let's defend our biogenetic commons in South Africa, despite them. We've also had a grassroots feminism in our orientation. This particular tool with people like Courtney and other young people have worked on, with Michelle, uh, one of our associates, was for the Metal Workers Union. Uh, and to make sure that in the context of grassroots struggles, the feminist question is front and center. Okay? There's other tools as well that we've developed uh, around the gender machinery in this country, which Andrew and, and, and uh, Michelle worked on, and so on. But the point is this, is to reject liberal feminism. It's not just breaking the glass ceiling, that's important. But it's also building the power of women from below to lead. And in all the cooperatives we work with, what has always struck us is that women have come to the fore to lead these processes, including in the food sovereignty campaign, by the way. The most powerful agents of change in these processes have been women. The final label which we've walked on is systemic alternatives and democratic Marxism. And here, we've basically been attempting to theorize, to clarify the praxis that we've been engaged with. So this was the first book on solidarity economy, and it was a dialogue between us as practitioners in South Africa, but others busy with the same processes in other parts of the world, in Brazil, in Italy, in the UK, and so on. This is the second and most recent book which we'll launch as part of this conference. It's on cooperatives in South Africa, advancing solidarity economy pathways from below. And it's a dialogue with government. So yes, we want the legislation, which is a democratic systemic reform, but there's various things the ANC government didn't do or did badly. It didn't implement, for example, a national forum for cooperators to come together and drive this legislation. If it did, we would be having a very different conversation about cooperatives in the country. It didn't do that. And it also didn't uh, allow us to build from below adequately. It institutionalized things from above. And we've had two failed corporate movement building experiences in South Africa from above. And that is why as COPAC, we've been advancing solidarity economy work from below. So there's a whole ecology of approaches based on tacit organic knowledge in this country around cooperatives. But they don't feature in the imagination of the state and its tick box mentality, performance management and so on. We just want 1,000 cooperatives. We want 200,000 cooperatives. It doesn't feature. The, that logic, that state-centric logic is very dangerous for these kinds of processes. The other project has been democratic Marxism. And here I must thank Mazibuka for the title of this volume. He says, Marxism is a dinner at our house. And that's the point. That is not one Marxism with all the answers to every question that we face. It's Marxism in the plural. And that's central to the democratic Marxism project. What's also central to the democratic Marxism project is putting Marxist, historical Marxism to work with all its rich uh, theoretical resources to understand where we are today in terms of capitalism, what is new, what is changing, in terms of accumulation, in terms of state power, uh, in terms of struggles, etc., etc. And this volume highlights the total crisis of capitalism, the civilizational crisis of capitalism. Uh, and it is happening. So capitalism has had about four big crises, the late 19th century, the interwar years, the 70s, and now. And this crisis has particular features to it that are unique. And these are, these are crisis tendencies that are expressing themselves beyond the conjunction. Meaning that it's, the neoliberal solutions are failing and the deeper underlying crisis tendencies are coming to the fore. The climate crisis, the food crisis, and they don't have solutions. The climate crisis is another volume that we brought together with leading climate justice activists in the Global South, uh, Nemo Basi from the Niger Delta, Pablo Solon, uh, and others, Patrick Bond, and various other comrades contributed to this volume. 
We have answers to the climate crisis. I keep on saying this. But the ruling elites have not been listening. They have not been listening for over 20 years and they've been prolonging the use of fossil fuels. This volume is around racism after apartheid. And again, it's, it's getting us to revisit what has been the intellectual inheritance we have in South Africa to think through race and racism. Where has it gone to? I mean, we now have a xenophobic politics in our mainstream. Okay? Where once upon a time there was a strong non-racialism. A lot of ground has been lost. Why? And so this volume is trying to explain that. But it is also trying to, to, to grapple with what is a new anti-racist politics today? Does it have to be in the framework of the national question or does it have to be in the framework of something else? What I would call the ecocide question. We'll talk about that. This is the most recent volume on the BRICS and the new empirical American imperialism. Uh, I don't like the cover. It's too busy. <laughs> But that should be out early in the new year. And I must say a big thank you to, to Sarah and the NIHSS for helping us digitize these volumes. Because this means that this resource is available to whoever wants to use it in South Africa, on our continent, and in the world. So these are not elite conversations. These are not elite resources. We've always developed the democratic Marxism volumes in a participatory way. These are activists and activist scholars contributing to it. So finally, just to say that we are at the frontiers of transformative politics, in my view, uh, with what we have been doing. Uh, I was saying this to Michelle when I was working on these slides. If we had a serious left party in South Africa, this is what it would have been doing. But we don't have a serious left party in South Africa. We have COPEC. <laughs> And so we've been busy doing these grassroots things, these interventions, uh, to keep a left imagination alive. And one of the breakthroughs we've made is a new theory of transformative change. So yes, there's a crisis of social ecological reproduction in South Africa. It's expressing itself conjuncturally and at a systemic level. And these things are converging. So they don't have answers, it's just more austerity in South Africa. Now the banks are getting hit and so on and so on. The workers are going to get squeezed more and more. The ANC is just nodded to Tito's austerity stuff, etc. At the same time, the climate crisis is worsening. The water crisis is worsening. The food system is in crisis. These things are converging. And so how do we intervene in that context? And our argument is that let's confront these systemic problems, these systemic contradictions that will bring down capitalism, by the way. And so let's have answers to those systemic contradictions. So what are our answers to the climate crisis? Okay. This is very central to our theory of change, and that is why we have a climate justice charter process. It's to provide popular, working class based answers to the climate crisis. The second point to make is that in our practice, we've gone beyond this binary reform versus revolution. Okay. What we've been doing is building from below, systematically. We've been basically trying to find pathways and spaces, instant, interstitially, alongside and outside capitalism. I mean, there's a whole reserve population that capitalism doesn't need in this country. They are outside. The link with wage earning and reproduction is broken. They're a surplus population. Okay? They are at the heart of the crisis of social, uh, social uh, ecolo ecological reproduction. So how do you work with those forces? Okay. So this is where advancing systemic change from below becomes important. The Cooperative Act is one example. The Cooperative Banking Act is another example. The People's Food Sovereignty Law, which we haven't passed in Parliament, is another example. The third point I want to make is that I think in the journey that we've been on, we've had to reflect on our subjectivity as actors. We are all in history, okay? we're engaging on the stage of history. But what is the subjectivity? Is it the old subjectivity okay, of destroying a system? Or is it something else? And so the conclusions we have reached is that this is a transformative subjectivity. It's about constituting power. Meaning we're not waiting to capture the state and then change the country. Through cooperative work, to solidarity economies, to food sovereignty, we are constituting people's power. We are not waiting to be in power. And that's a difference. Okay. The other point about the subjectivity 
is emancipatory eco-utopia. Which means that we are dreaming, we're desiring another world, but we are doing it in struggle. And we are doing it as we are building the institutions that embody those values. Okay? And this is very, very important. And you'll get a glimpse of that on the campus tomorrow when we take you to the food sovereignty center, to the farmer's market, and things like that. Commoning is very, very important. And for us, we've created a knowledge commons. So, this is actually going even beyond Paul Fred, because it's a knowledge common in the digital period, or era, okay? Where we can share all kinds of resources from wherever we are struggling to learn from each other, farmer to farmer exchanges, seed exchanges, etc., etc., okay? But it's, it's also not just an intellectual commons, it's also a biogenetic commons. It's about the fundamental resources that give us life, okay? And how do we defend those commons, and so on. The other aspect of the subjectivity is the collective intellectual. Now, Antonio Gramsci was thinking about the collective intellectual vis-a-vis -vis the Communist Party, the modern prince. But we have been building a collective intellectual in this process. So the Democratic Marxism series is about a collective intellectual discourse. It's not about Vishwa Sarkar, no. It's about all the intellectuals we have in this country, bringing them to engage around various foci. Okay. If we don't have a collective intellectual practice, we cannot have a common perspective about where we want to take society and so on. So the collective intellectual has been central to the subjectivity we've been trying to engender. And then, of course, there's the idea about radical selves. So yes, it's not collectives at the expense of the individual. We must go beyond homo economicus, because that's what neoliberalism is all about. Mm -hmm. Our subjectivities are about the market and buying and shopping and being in debt and so on. Homo solidarius is where we are in social relations with other people, mm -hmm. in society. Society exists, Margaret Thatcher is wrong, it's not dead, okay? But while we are in those relationships, we are also beautiful human beings. And we must also flourish in those relationships. And that's what we've been trying to do. And you'll be exposed to some of the mural art that we'll be sharing. That is part of a collective process, but it is also the expression of an individual artist that is very sensitive to the socio-ecological condition. It's also about being beyond vanguard Marxism. Unfreezing Marxism from dogma and connecting it with other forces on the horizon that also have answers. Whether it is the earth traditions of our civilization, they have answers to various questions. They have the most intimate relationship with the web of life. We can learn from those earth traditions. And Marx and Marxism offer us starting points, from alienation to the metabolic rift and so on. But there's other knowledge systems we can learn from. Similarly, feminism. Feminism has powerful analysis. It has powerful critique. It has powerful praxis that we can learn from. And we need to be in an intimate dialogue with feminism. And finally, I want to say that what we've been busy with is democratic eco-socialism. We have been about creating an imagination in which there is another project for the country and beyond. And this takes me to this point, that COPAC is not indispensable. I was just telling others I work with, um, and telling Michelle, even if we close COPAC tomorrow, we've left all these resources there. It's planting seeds. They need to germinate, okay? We've done our work. If you look at all the resources we've done on seeds, on food sovereignty, on water, and we're going to be launching a land use guide, these are the basics of eco-socialism and a democratic eco-socialism. You don't need COPEC to take those resources and build in your communities, in your movements, in your organizations. We are not the movement, but we are a catalytic force. You are the agent of transformation. And we've been having these debates for 20 years with the UPM, with the waste pickers, with the small scale farmers, with cooperatives, etc., etc., etc. Because the dependency relationships are easy, very easy. And we are not one of those NGOs that like the dependency. No, we don't like the dependency. You must walk on your own feet. Okay. So this is very, very important for us. So finally, I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank our grassroots partners 
and organizations we've journeyed with over the years. It's really nice to have some of you in the room. I don't know if Pumzile is here, but Pumzile came to the first uh, Solidarity Economy Conference we've had. I think he's on his way. And Pumzile uh, is a young person from the Eastern Cape. And when he came to the COPEC, the one conference, I think he was about 19 years old. And I think today, where is he? Uh, he's leading his own cooperative in rural Eastern Cape. And I really wanted him here. That's an example for me of the kind of relationships that we built over the years. The other is the waste pickers. And I really wanted Simon Nibata here, and I'm sure he's going to join us. But they've been pioneering worker cooperatives. We've helped them in that journey. And it's very, very important for their philosophy of zero waste. I also wanted us to have uh, people like Mazibuko and others here. They've been pioneering work on their own, but we've learned from them, and I'm sure they've learned from us in this journey. Having Marcus Solomon and the Children's Resources Center here today is also important. We've learned from them and we're hoping they've learned from us. So it's been a journey with some very, very exciting, uh, dynamic grassroots forces in South Africa. It's all not just about the looting and the Zondo Commission and so on. There's other things happening in South Africa beneath the surface. I want to thank the board. When COPEC started, we had some of the most powerful people in the country, key leaders of trade unions and so on on the board of COPAC. Some of them became cabinet ministers actually, uh, and they resigned after you, because uh, they were up there, which is fine. Uh, we continue doing the work. But we have a core board, and I'd really thank, I'd like to thank them all, Jackie Cock, um, Annie Subru, Dora couldn't be here today because her father passed away. Uh, we're a small board, we're a small organization. But the idea is not to to have a professional NGO. Uh, we had 18 people working for COPAC once upon a time when I was the executive director. But we were chasing money all the time. But now we have solid partners that don't compromise our purpose. Uh, thank you to the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for not telling us what to believe and what to think. Thank you to the FES also and others. And there's quite a few actually uh, that have journeyed with us over the years. I want to thank the core team uh, of young people. So COPEC has been training young people in this space. Uh, Andrew's here, he was with us for about what, five years, Andrew? Yes. Uh, Atish is not here, but he was also with us. Um, uh, and various others. I mean, I, and there's so many names. But today we have Courtney and we have Jane. And Jane is the executive manager of COPEC. And they've been doing an excellent job on all these fronts of struggle that we've been busy with. Uh, and these are young people that bring a dynamism uh, and an enthusiasm uh, to all of this work. I also want to thank the associates, uh, Michelle being one of them, uh, and uh, Mazibuko, and various others uh, who are not here today. Uh, and, and finally, I, I mean, I'd just like to thank all of you for your attention and your time. I hope you enjoy the conference. Amanda. Uh -huh.